So I'm going to show you how to master the questions on potential energy and kinetic energy. This is Grimeda Physics and other channels where they teach you the content, but I'm going to show you how to get that grade 9. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know to master the topic of potential and kinetic energy. Energy is the ability to cause change and actually differences are the drivers of those changes. There's this crucial transfer between a potential store and a kinetic store. James Joule is the person that we named the unit for energy after, and with good reason. He did a lot of work on thermodynamics and the relationship between thermodynamics and work, so mechanical work and heating basically. That's how a steam engine works, but that's all for another day. Really I want to talk about this value of energy and how we can calculate energy. I want to talk about a distinction between some stores of energy today. I want to compare the potential energies and kinetic energies. And that's something that he did. He was a brewer in Salford and he wanted to buy a steam engine and he wanted to work out a way to compare the power of some different steam engines. So what he did was compared how quickly they could lift a set of masses through a set distance. So the same mass through the same distance and how fast they did. Now bear with me while we work through the algebra because this is gonna be really important about how we can calculate the size of energy stores shortly. So if you think about the our equation for work done, that's essentially what he wanted to measure, how quickly they they did the same work. So work done is force times distance. What force did he use? He used the force of the weight of an object. So weight is mass times gravitational field strength. And then he worked out the power by doing work done divided by time. I know there's a bit of confusion there between the capital W for work done in the first equation and the capital W for weight here. But essentially this weight is this force here. So really what he actually did was he actually measured how quickly those steam engines were able to do work to store energy in a gravitational store. So let's have a little look at that in a bit more detail. Work done is force times distance. And he was talking about lifting a certain mass through a certain height. So the distance that we were talking about wasn't a distance at all, it was a height. And the force that he used was this mass has a weight. So weight is mass times gravitational field strength. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute my equation for force here into this equation for work done. And I'm also going to replace the delta S for displacement with my H for height. Then I will have an equation for the potential energy that this mass will have at this height here. So equation for force goes in instead of force here and my algebra for height goes in instead of displacement. It really is that simple. We've just replaced the force with a weight or mg and we've replaced the displacement in our work done equation with the height or h because that is the displacement that we've done by moving it through a distance h. So this, this is our equation for potential energy. This is our equation for the gravitational potential energy store. Gravitational potential energy is equal to mass times gravitational field strength times height. So with that idea, we now define what one joule is. One joule is one newton through one meter or one newton raised by one meter. That's 100 grams raised in Earth's gravitational field by one meter is one joule of gravitational potential energy. There are three stores that I'm going to talk to you about in this video. They're the kinetic store, gravitational potential store, and the elastic potential store. Have a little pause now and think what might the factors be into the sizes of those stores. In other words, what causes a kinetic store to be larger, a gravitational potential store to be larger, elastic potential store to be larger? Kinetic stores depend on the mass and the speed. More mass, more energy stored in the kinetic store. More speed more energy stored in the kinetic store i have another video on kinetic energy itself but kinetic energy is proportional to speed squared what does gravitational potential energy depend on it depends on mass gravitational field strength and height and it's proportional to those three things so double the mass double the gravitational potential double the gravitational field strength double the gravitational potential energy double the height double the gravitational potential energy and lastly elastic potential and again there's another video on that elastic potential energy store that depends on the stiffness of whatever we're talking about and it depends on the extension of whatever we're talking about this video is all about transferring the energy between those stores difference is the driver of change. So because something is higher up, it has more gravitational potential energy. Because something is extended further, it has more elastic potential energy. And you have more energy then available to do work and therefore increase the kinetic store of an object. 
So these are the equations and you're going to need to know all of these. You're going to need to memorize all of these. Go ahead and pause now and see if you can remember these equations. Gravitational potential energy is mass times gravitational field strength times height. Work done, and that's a transfer between stores. The work done is not a store of energy, it's a way of moving energy between stores. It's force times distance moved. The equation for kinetic energy is a half times mass times speed squared. And the equation for elastic potential energy is a half times the stiffness, the spring constant, times extension squared. Let's talk about this transfer between potential and kinetic energy then. And we've come across this example before. At the most basic level, one of the important patterns in the universe is this transfer between potential stores and kinetic stores. So like the ability to do something, the ability to make something happen, that's a potential. And a kinetic, when something is actually happening, when, when we have something moving at a certain speed. And there's a distinction between potential and kinetic energies. Uh, potential energy is energy because of something's position. So because something is stretched out or because something is high up. So it's a difference in position that actually stores that energy. So kinetic energy is something storing energy because it's moving. So I looked at experiments where you can actually measure the energy stored in stretching something and then measure the kinetic energy of something. And we use that to do an actual calculation. And the point about energy is, and we'll keep coming back to this point as we study energy, is that you can calculate the sizes of the stores and then you can use those stores, those calculations, to make other calculations. It's a really important idea, the idea of energy analysis. If we want Want a pellet to go a certain distance we can work out just how far we need to pull our catapult back and that's just a for example let's do some practice calculations to get your head around some of those equations pause the video now and have a go at these two pretty simple ones firstly and we always start our calculations like this we write out the equation that we're going to use these questions aren't in words so they're already ready to go into the equation so just before we do that check we're using si units yep that is 12 newtons per meter that's okay yep that extension is in meters and just check that we've copied down our values correctly and we've copied down terms like the square in our equation now we reach for the calculator 0.24 joules same for the gravitational potential energy store always start by writing out the equation identify the values and substitute them in so we have 40 kilograms g will be given to you it's 10 newtons per kilogram roughly it's 9.81 to three significant figures. We can use 10 for this question. And two, two meters. Yes, they're all in SI, so they can just go straight in. And now reach for the calculator. That is 800 joules of gravitational potential energy. So we're talking about energy stores. And essentially what's happening is we're starting with our energy stored in the elastic store of the elastic band. And then there's an energy transfer. And that transfer is because of this force that actually pulls the elastic band back to its original shape. And then the elastic band is now moving. That energy has now been stored in the kinetic store. Whenever we talk about energy stores and transfers, we want to talk about one store emptying and then how it gets from one store into another store. And the way that it gets between them is by doing work in this case, this mechanical work. It's energy transferred by forces. That's the definition of work done. So the whole story of that is that we've taken the energy stored in that elastic band in the elastic store of it and we've transferred that into the gravitational store of it because it's now up in a gravity field. So that's a really simple idea then. We've taken that same energy and we've transferred it into another store. And that's a really important point. It's the same energy that we've taken from the elastic store and we've put that into the kinetic store. And then eventually we've put that into the gravitational store. It's the exact same energy. So let's see if this more detailed explanation works for you then. It actually starts by me extending the elastic band. So I do work on the elastic band to stretch it. That's work done is force times distance. Then that energy is stored in the elastic potential store of the elastic band. That's this equation here. It's the same energy. It's the same value. Then work is done by the elastic band in returning it to its original shape. So again, we've got work done is force times distance. Then the energy is now stored in the kinetic store of whatever I'm firing of a pellet or the band itself. Then that energy is again transferred against gravity by doing work against gravity to lift the elastic band up or lift the pellet up. And then eventually that same energy is stored in the gravitational potential store of whatever I fired. You could go further, couldn't you? Because now work could be done to bring it back down, back into a kinetic store and so on. So there's this constant transfer between a potential store and a kinetic store and a potential store. 
Where this stuff really gets hard though is the energy analysis questions, so bear with this section. So let's have a go at some questions and these are gonna be getting hard now, so pay attention. First of all, let's decode what we're asked to do. I can see the command word calculate. I need to calculate the maximum height it could reach. And I also need to suggest reasons why it's not gonna reach the height in reality. What can we actually do to work this out? Well, they've given us the stiffness, they've given us a mass, and they've given us an extension. What's the maximum height it could reach? So, well, I think that this is gonna be about the elastic potential store and that transfer into that gravitational potential store. So what I'm actually saying is the elastic store that I begin with is equal to the potential energy store that I end up with. It's the same energy. I can work this one out and hence work this one out. Now there is a shortcut to this, but I'm actually gonna work out a value and then I'm gonna put it back into an equation here. So the elastic potential energy store is a half times the stiffness times the extension squared. Read my question again and put those values in. Just check that they're all in SI units. A half times 200 newtons per meter, yep, that's okay. Times 0.25 meters, yep, that's okay. So let's work that one out then. 6.25 joules of elastic potential energy. So we fired that straight up. So we've transferred all of that energy into the potential energy store. Now I know some of you will be thinking, well, not all of it because of efficiency, but let's come to that when we do the suggest part of this question. So actually what we now know is that this is the value of the potential energy. And we know that the potential energy is mgh, mass times gravitational field strength times h. And again, I'm gonna use g as just 10 for this example just for simplicity's sake. And they've given us the mass. They've given us the mass is 0.5 kilograms. So the next step after we've written it out and identified our data is just to substitute the numbers in and we're going to actually work out a value of h here, to calculate the maximum height it could reach. Now we can just do inverse operations. So 6.25 divided by 0.5 times 10 and 0.5 times 10 is five. 1.25 meters. That question is worded such that we're calculating the maximum height it could possibly reach. It's asked us to suggest reasons why it will not really reach that height in reality. And the answer is to do with every single time we transfer energy, we lose a bit of energy to heating of the surroundings. We do some work against friction. We do some work against air resistance. And actually one thing that James Joule did work out is that actually every single time we do mechanical work, we also do some heating. Literally, this is a statement that you really should memorize. It'll come up time and time again when we're talking about efficiency. Some of the energy is transferred to the thermal store of the surroundings. Another way to say a similar thing is that you could also say work is also done. Work is also done against friction and air resistance. So the pellet does not reach the maximum height. The point is that not all of the energy not all of the energy is actually ending up in the gravitational store. Another question then, let's read it and decode it. A student observes a pellet fired from a catapult which is pulled back further, leaves the catapult at a higher speed. Use ideas about energy to explain this. So the point is, we've got to really add some value to this. They pull it back further, so that means that there's more energy in the elastic store and it goes at a higher speed, so there's more energy in the kinetic store. We've got to add value. They haven't actually said potential or kinetic in this question. So that's what we're really looking for in this question. We're looking for you identifying that those are the two stores that we're talking about. Further means more energy in the elastic store and faster means more energy in the kinetic store. So really think about that, look for the clues in the question. They've told you further, they've told you faster. So you need to think about what that means for the different energy stores involved in that transfer. Lastly, and a little bit of a harder one because we've got a rearrangement here and we've also got a unit conversion. So let's go ahead and work through this. Calculate the kinetic energy of a pellet and then later it says calculate its speed. This is really two command words in one question, so answer it as if it's two questions. First of all, calculate the kinetic energy of a pellet. So you haven't actually been given the speed of it, you actually have to calculate the speed at the end, but it's asked you to calculate the kinetic store. So how are you going to calculate a kinetic store if you have not been given a speed? Well, 
the point is that all of the energy that was stored in the elastic potential store has been transferred into the kinetic store. So it's the same energy. Think about that. One store empties, another store fills. The same energy is being transferred by mechanical work from the elastic potential store into the kinetic store. So if we want to work out the kinetic store, in fact, we need to work out the elastic store first. Now when we look at the question this time, yes we do have our spring constant K in SI units, 30 newtons per meter, but our extension is actually in centimeters, it's actually in 20 centimeters. So we need to convert that into meters before we go any further. 0.6 joules. Now it seems like quite a small amount of energy and it is, but we're firing a pellet with a mass of 3 grams. So that's not in SI units as well, so we need to convert that before we go any further into kilograms. So we've already got about three marks already because we've been asked to work out the kinetic store, and there it is. But there's probably another two marks maybe for working out then the speed. So now we have to use our equation for kinetic energy, which is a half mv squared, half times mass times speed squared, and substitute the values in, and I've done the conversion already, so I don't make that error. and we know that the kinetic energy is 0.6. So now we can do our rearranging. So V squared equals 400. Now that is not our final answer because we don't want V squared, we want V. So V is root 400. Does that seem sensible? A pellet fired from a catapult, a speed of 20 meters per second? Yeah, that does seem quite fast, but that's within the reasonable bounds of speeds you might expect. 20 meters per second is about 40 miles an hour. I would say that's about the speed of a pellet. Okay, and you can see here, because I was showing my work out, I spotted errors that I made. And that's a really important point to make. The big idea in this topic is that one store empties, another store fills. Keep thinking about that idea. We transfer energy from one store to another, and it's the same value of energy. We'll come back to it later, but the law of conservation of energy is that we can never create or destroy energy. So a potential store empties, the kinetic store fills, or a kinetic store empties and the potential store fills. And the key point is that we can calculate the values of those stores, and we can use those in later calculations. So last but by no means least, let's put this into a bit of a context for you. So imagine a bungee jump. I mean, would you do a bungee jump? I know I wouldn't, I'd be terrified but they actually have to carefully calculate the size of the energy stores before anyone jumps from a bungee rope. They have to actually work out the person's mass to work out that they are not gonna be too much energy in that gravitational store such that the bungee rope extends too far and they either splash into the water or they have a much worse time than that. So remember, energy is a measure of like how much work can be done, and that's a number that we can calculate. And we're gonna do work on that rope, whether we like it or not, we're gonna extend it, and so, because we've got that energy, we have to transfer that somewhere. So the stores involved in this bungee jump are the gravitational store to begin with and the elastic potential store at the end. Yes, there's this bit about them going through the kinetic store, and yes, there will be some energy wasted and energy transferred to heating the surroundings. We can say that roughly, there's gonna be the exact same value of energy transferred into this store. Certainly, there isn't going to be more energy at the end in this second store than there was at the beginning. I've actually laid it out because these calculations are quite complicated, this idea of calculating one store and using it for another store. So I've laid it out, pause it, work through this question and see if you can work out whether this person is going to splash into that river or not. So these are pretty complicated because, well, you've also got to deal with this different heights, like length of the rope and the height above the water. When you're working out the potential energy, you should use the length of the rope here because you want the potential energy that they have before that energy starts being transferred into the elastic store. So firstly, the energy they have, the potential energy they have to transfer into the elastic store is 80 times 10 times 25. So that's 20,000 joules. You've been given the spring constant of the rope and you've been given the height of the jump above the water. So next you have to work out the extension. So substitute those values in and rearrange gives you extension is equal to the root of 20,000 over 200 times 0.5. So the extension comes out as 14 meters. So that is not the height that you need to use. They haven't just gone down a total of 14 meters. They've gone down a total of the length of the rope, the original length of the rope, 25 meters plus 14. So the total extended length of the rope is 39 meters. So they're not gonna splash 
because the height of the jumper off the water was 40 meters. Hopefully you followed that. If not, rewind this section and go through that one more time because here's another similar question with the same reasoning. Go through this one. So pause and go through this one. So again, we work out the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy before the rope gets extended. And that is the length of the rope multiplied by the height multiplied by G and we've used roughly here, G as 10. That means the gravitational potential energy they have is 12,000 joules. Spring cons the rope again is 200 meters, but this time the height of the jump is only 30 meters above the water. So work out the extension by substituting the values in and rearranging gives you this value here and the extension of the rope is therefore 11 meters the original length of the rope was 20 so you need to add those together so 31 meters so they will splash in fact they're going to dunk one meter into that water they can ask you some really tricky questions about energy analysis but actually the principle is work out one store and use that to make another calculation here he is big Doug Make sure they tie it right, son. Scouts. Crikey, that's high. Here we go. Three. Don't tuck it in. Hey! Three, two. Oh, he's gone. He's gone already. Here we go. The principle is one store empties, another store fills. I hope that helped. If you did, just comment boom in the comments below.